This is Kanzenshu the podcast, episode 311, for the week of September 30th, 2012. What up, folks? Welcome to Kanzen Shu, the podcast, an extension of the all encompassing Dragon Ball fan site. Kanzen Shu. Correct. We cover anything and everything Dragon Ball in hopes of enlightening and a little bit of entertaining. I am your usual host, Mr. Mike Vegito EX. Joining me, it's been a little bit since we talked to you here on the podcast. Heath, Mr. Hujio. Also from the aforementioned Kanzenshu. Welcome back, man. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back. It's been way too long. Like, what, a month? It's been over a month at this point. No, that's true. It's been like five weeks, six weeks. Yeah. it's It's been uh, very busy times, actually. <laughs> Are you ready to divulge what your special project was? Uh, Well, my special project commenced like, well, at this point, 10 months ago, <laughs> but it came to fruition five weeks ago. Uh-huh. So yeah, on uh, September 27th, or no, September, <laughs> August 27th, uh, we woke up at 5 a.m. and my wife went into labor. So we rushed to the hospital and uh, we have a beautiful little baby boy who will be five weeks. Oh, congratulations, man. Thank you. So excited for you. I mean, we've been excited and sharing in the excitement for a while now, but uh, this is the podcast announcement i guess yes officially he's been on twitter so (laughs) right right so if you've been following along maybe you've seen some of this stuff but what uh amazes me and maybe it's because you're falling into jake territory here where you just don't sleep but uh you've managed to (laughs) continue to produce website content this entire time i'm extremely impressed i really don't know how i've done it um, I don't either, man. Most of it is lack of sleep. Yeah. Uh, for the most part. Some of the pages I had done previously. Right, right. So there wasn't a whole lot that went into it. Uh-huh. But I still had to put them up. And then some of the pages, which I have some that I'm working on now that aren't even up. And that is literally, I'm awake at 3 a.m. And what do I do? No, I guess I can type something. <laughs> That's good. You have not missed a Monday yet on the animation styles guide. You've come close to missing a Monday, but you have not missed a Monday posting. I'm so impressed. I am impressed as well. In fact, I feel maybe coming up here in the next week or two, I might kind of miss one. That's okay, man. We'll see. We'll see. Take a break because maybe Mike has some stuff coming. I don't know. Let's talk about website content later on to wrap up the show because I do want to just kind of briefly go over some of the folks you have updated with. But you are here. It's just you and I for right now. We are going to cover the news and all that general stuffage. And then you're going to jump away for about an hour. I will be joined by my good buddy, Joe. You might know him on Twitter as Space Kappa. He joined me last year along with our buddy Dustin to cover Ultimate Tenka Ichi. He's going to be joining me again shortly to cover Dragon Ball Z for Connect on the Xbox 360. But this week, just because we have that Dragon Ball video game season upon us, I wanted to dive into that realm a little bit, but I wanted to go far into the past. We covered the Super Butoden series on the Super Famicom and three related games. You can probably guess what those three games are if you think about it. Probably not too hard. So that is going to be your topic for the week. We talked about the games kind of like retrospective reviews on them a little bit and we talked a lot about the music because you know how we are and uh, almost this parallel history of Dragon Ball going on in the video game world alongside the TV adaptation as that came to a close. So that's your topic this week. Uh, Heath, man, any Dragon Ball stuff going on for you besides a child? Um, no, not really. Um, I did, uh, maybe we can post this link up. Okay. I don't know. All right. Or maybe this is too personal, but okay. I, uh, I threw my son on the floor one night and- <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. Pulled... You threw him. Are you saying that you, I threw you him. placed him I, on the floor or- I gently laid him down. Okay. All right. And, uh, I pulled out one of my Japanese dragon boxes and I'm like, you know- I wonder, and I sat down on the floor, and I had to take a picture because it was literally the size of a Japanese dragon box. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you put it on. You just like sat him in front and said, go. Now's the go. time. We are marathoning. But that's equally awesome. Yes. But other than that, no. I really okay. don't have anything else. No, just animation style guide updates. That's good enough. That's good yep. enough. All right. We are jam-packed with the news and the topic, so I say we take it on over to that news right now. 
Uh, we're kind of going to flip flop back and forth, I guess, on news. First one here over in the video game world. This is about Dragon Ball Z for Kinect for the Xbox 360, and it is with regard to pre-ordering on Amazon, if you do pre-order on Amazon, you will get a Goku hair hat. The Goku hair will be packaged with the game. Offer valid when shipped and sold by Amazon.com. Limit one per household. Amazon reserves the right to change or terminate this promotion at any time. Heath, I'm pretty sure this is the wraparound cardboard Goku hair that Funimation and Namka Bandai have been tossing out at trade shows and conventions for maybe the last like a year or so. Yeah, that's almost a exactly what it looks like so maybe they overstocked i don't know it's just a surplus of this crappy cardboard hanging out there so i don't know if you can call it crappy because it just looks so cool i mean who would not want that i didn't take it it was because i didn't go to otakon this year so it was otakon 2011 uh it was a big dragon ball year because they were hyping the blu-ray sets look where that went they were handing out the uh cardboard goku hair i didn't take one back then so i don't know if it's got a nice thickness to it or if it's just kind of flimsy uh, i know they passed them out at comic-con as well i've seen namka bandai handing them out at cons so yeah there's just a lot of cardboard hanging out there it's like they joined up with Burger King and yep. they're like, hey, you guys make crowns. We should do this. It does look like a Burger King crown. <laughs> Yeah. exactly the same all right that's not that interesting but uh if you pre-order on amazon and right now it is three cents cheaper than msrp that's a little bonus you can get that's a hell of a saving hell of a savings uh heath all right let's turn it over to next year's biggest news probably the new movie coming out in japan in march okay so this was originally reported by Crunchyroll on september 19th and it quickly you know kind of circulated the internet but it turns out that Toei Animation has been granted 50 million yen, which in U.S. dollars is about $636,000. And it's part of this nonprofit organization, Uni Japan, and they host a co-production certification program where basically films that are going to be co-produced with foreign companies can receive an allotted grant to help fund say, production costs or promotional items for probably these foreign countries. And Dragon Ball Z, the upcoming movie for 2013, was the only animated film to receive such a grant. So that's actually pretty cool. The program was developed by the Japanese government's Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. And then there are some other affiliated organizations like movie companies that also put money in uh, to this nonprofit certification program. And basically, this Japanese film, uh, I think there were four total, all received government funding to help them support. Uh, basically, Japan abroad is what they do. They want to get Japan outside of the country really make themselves more global. And I think, I don't know, maybe someone that doesn't like government won't like this as much, but to see government support of the country in this way is, is kind of neat. And it's not something that I think you would see a lot of other countries do. Now, I'm pretty sure there's a big move. I forget when this started. I want to say within the last decade uh, within Japan, just exactly what this is, just government funding to help promote pop culture, but also just Japanese culture in general abroad. And if I'm understanding correctly, this is specifically for things being co-funded with international partners, and it seems to mm -hmm. be geared toward that promotion aspect of it abroad so i'm sure it can be used for things like the actual production of right. the item but because typically uh as far as i'm aware i, I did look back at a couple of the films that have received this mm -hmm. um though because the program's only been going a couple years now okay. from what i read but typically they're theatrical films but not too many animation films have ever received funding so it was actually a pretty big deal because uh your film, you have to send it in, and then there's a panel of judges that decide whether you will receive a grant for your film. So apparently Toei and Fox, the U.S. company that's helping to back production, right. stepped up and said, we would like to apply for this. And because Dragon Ball Z is such an international phenomenon, they said we basically will totally back you guys with this 50 million yen yeah it seems like a perfect fit for that kind of program yeah well uh i guess keep us going more news for uh, next year's movie we've got the art director hiroshi kato so uh it was first announced i guess this was another thing that we 
Didn't really catch, and I'm not too sure how long this has been out, but mm. this is the first I had seen it. I haven't seen it on any other Japanese fan sites, really. But uh, the main page on Toei's website, which is not the official website for the Dragon Ball Z movie itself. Oh, man, there's always situations like that. Like every time there's a new video game, Namco Bandai would have a page yeah. for it and then the developer would have a page for it and it'd be different info. It's a pain. Yeah, there's there's a, was it DragonBallZ2013.com? Right. Is the official website for the movie, but then Toei itself has a website for the movie. Fuji TV has its own website. So weren't there like three or four different Dragon Ball Kai websites at one point yeah. too? It was, well, each right. main company basically has their own website. Yeah, which yeah. is really weird. You think you just have one, but all right. So this this not official. So, well, I mean, it's an yeah. Official so not site, the but. official site, but they listed the four main uh, directors. I guess you would call them yeah, for the yeah. movie. Uh, three we had already known because they've been listed with all the promotional material, but this was the first time that we actually got to see that Hiroshi Kato was listed as the art director for the upcoming movie. Uh, he's a newcomer to the franchise, someone that we've never seen before, but he's been heavily involved in the anime industry since 1993. Uh, a lot of people will probably know him from Neon Genesis Evangelion, and some may know him from Ah oh My Goddess um, and Space Brothers, which is his most recent work, uh, but I've never seen it myself. I'm not even sure what channel it's on. Uh, but he, he is currently overseeing the background art division at Totonion, which is actually short for Totony Animation. So you got to love the acronyms there. Mm-hmm. And just smush yeah. all those words together. So he uh, is in charge of the, or the company itself is in charge of all the animation, um, background art, overseeing scene designs, CG animation, and and the like. So we assume that everything we've seen so far has come from Tetonion. And from there, I guess we'll just have to wait and see what the actual credits say. But um, from what we've seen so far, everything I think looks really good. And it's nice to actually have a name to go along with things because it, it kind of gives us a storied background of what this guy has done. You know, I think we're going to jump around in the news a little bit because we have one more story about the upcoming movie. So, uh, Heath, we posted this up on the 26th. There was a press release you dug back and uh, took a look into. Yeah, this this also comes from Toei's unofficial website for the new Dragon Ball Z movie. And this was posted, the the official press release was posted on July 17th, 2012. So it was something that a lot of people have talked about, you know, when is the time frame of this movie? And once Yusuke Watanabe publicly confirmed on his Twitter account when the scenario was going to take place, we kind of, you know, stopped looking just like everybody else. Well, apparently around the same time, Toei had actually released a press statement And they said that the global phenomenon Dragon Ball is being made into a movie and all this great stuff. But then at the end, they do note that the episode will take place between the animation series Z and GT, or in other words, from the blank decade between the end of the battle with Majin Buu and chapter 517 of the manga and chapter 518. So, you know, it gives us a pretty good indication of what we already knew, but at the same time, they kind of divulge that... Here are some characters that are going to be in it, but they may only make appearances, and this is an official story, and all sorts of weird things that I'm kind of surprised they even included in a press statement, but... You know, it's fodder for the fanboys out there, I suppose. Do we have to have this conversation? The quote that we have translated here. A new story in the official history of Dragon Ball is born. Neither a spin-off nor a side story. One that can be enjoyed by both children and parents, manga fans, and anime fans. Dragon Ball, we've talked about this. I've talked about this specifically. I've written articles about this. How no one in charge of the series in any capacity has ever made a statement saying... Well, this is absolute truth. We consider this canon to the blah, blah, blah. And here's our official timeline that we follow when we do stuff. No one's ever said anything like this. This is the first instance of a quote like this. Which is why I'm really surprised it's included. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like something that maybe a lot of us take for granted. Like we would see on a forum, somebody saying, well, is this canon? Well, we don't know. Well, well, what do you mean you don't know? There's got to be an answer. Yeah. So they've actually come out and said, no, this is an official story. And I think more so probably what they meant is Toriyama is involved very deeply. Uh, basically, for the first time in any movie, 
So it is more likely that you can consider this part of the original storyline, which is kind of what they did with the Jump Super Anime Tour special, as in this is going to fit in with everything. We've had hints of these kinds of statements before, but they've never taken it to this level. And that all being said, there is still a valid school of thought, I think, that says, unless Toriyama conceives the entire thing personally from start to finish, I will not consider this a part of the canon. And then you can take that even further and have people who think, and I understand every single one of these viewpoints, if Toriyama didn't write it during the original publishing time period, I don't want to consider it part of the official story. So no matter what they say and whoever that they is, you still have people that are going to consider it whatever it is they want to consider it. But I think it is worth noting this is the first time ever they have made such a concrete statement about how official they consider it. And now people can just run with it. So yep. there you go. And that's the last we'll talk about that for a while. All right. So I think that's the end of the movie news. I'll take it away a little bit. Uh, this one snuck up on us out of nowhere. We knew obviously that Heroes was going to have some new stuff. Janemba Baby, the actual name of the character there. Yeah, we jab, screw that up. Jab, jab at myself there. Uh, showing up in Heroes, this Galaxy Mission 4-ish, I think, time frame we're looking at in terms of updates for the game. So all that's going on. Great. Uh, the thing that snuck up is the November issue of V-Jump. Remember, V-Jump is Shueisha's video game focused magazine, obviously an offshoot of their jump line. So you've got weekly showing and jump. Does monthly jump exist anymore? I don't think it is. Uh, it's mostly turned into, uh, Jump Square. Okay, I was gonna say, is Monthly Jump and then Square, did they roll together into Psycho? But I guess Square's still around, no, Monthly's still gone, around, Psycho's there. It's their main monthly one, and until they release Psycho, then Whatever. that also became monthly. I don't think anyone, I don't think Shueisha knows what they're doing with Jump. Anyway, so the November issue of V-Jump had some extra cool stuff in there. It's got a nice cover. Heath, isn't it weird seeing Dragon Ball GT art popping up all over the place? It really is. It's like, what decade is this? Because you would think we're like living through the point when GT was coming out because Past that point, everything has been Dragon Ball or Z era. And it's not that they've ignored GT. I mean, especially over in the video game realm. Yeah, they would start with the DBZ and then they would expand into GT. So by the time you get to the end of Meteor, you had all the Super Saiyan 4 forms and Ishinron and Super Ishinron. He was in Budokai 3. I mean, GT was still there fleshing out the universe, but it hasn't received this heavy of a focus really since 1997. So uh, V-Jump November issue, not only did it come up with a card i think it's a janemba baby card yeah it's one we've seen before uh but it has this mini manga for dragon ball heroes the dragon ball heroes victory mission mini manga i like this we have uh, is this the first official imprint naming of the hero avatar as beat it's beat though so beat uh, obviously it's kind of the name pun here but i feel like i've seen him called beat before was it in yeah. like gameplay videos or something it's been in gameplay videos okay because he's a he's a character that's existed ever since they first launched dragon ball heroes yeah yeah, yeah. He, he is the main character basically in the very first promo they run yep at where uh, he slaps he, a he card runs down. in slaps a card down yep. uh dragon souls playing all that so right, right. okay yeah all right, so we've seen the name before. Uh, yep. It's this little mini manga. Really, it's there to promote Janemba Baby. It's is it just a couple pages? It's two pages. Okay, so mini is very, very mini. Yes. But here's the thing that's setting the internet afire is who is the author and or artist of this mini manga? It does not appear to be Naho Oishi because if it was Oishi, it would say oishi naho next to the artist credit and really it doesn't say artist it says manga is that the typical way that they label the artist i don't think so not always um sometimes sometimes uh if if it's split up between the story and mm -hmm. then whoever's illustrating they'll specifically note okay i think this is just something that they happen to do they just threw manga all right um, and it's two it, pages, it might mean so. more so that that this person did not actually come up with these stories. Somebody pitched the concept and he said, okay, I'll draw it. 
right, right. Yeah, so you have two pages. Be. Here's like three lines you need to say. Fill up two pages. Like for all we know, you know, it's it's Namco Bandai said, "Hey, can you uh, sure. do this for us?" And V Jump said, "Yeah, we'll print it. We'll get somebody to right because they're all in bed with each other. I mean, right. Square Enix, Namco Bandai, Shueisha. That's may as well just be one giant company. Anyway, so the credit here is Toyotaro, an extended O at the very end of Taro. Now you may recognize that first part that Toy as from a somewhat prominent Japanese fan artist. That's not enough to go on here, I don't think. But a lot of people are comparing the art styles. But part of me is like, well, copying Toriyama's art style perfectly is doable by a very talented artist. I don't know, Heath. We have to address it. What are your thoughts here? Is Toyotaro toyable? I think it probably is, um, but unfortunately, when I did the post, it's there's just not anything concrete to go on besides this is who we think it is, and I didn't want to spread the rumor or you know. Yeah, I'm actually kind of glad you didn't drop Toyable's name in the post itself because that kind of puts it at ease a little bit, and it gives us a chance here in the context of a conversation to dive into it a little further the thing that happens a lot in the doujin to professional world is once someone crosses that line they either do change their professional name and then we have things like oishi where no one's really seen her before and maybe she had done some i don't want to say scandalous stuff because i mean if you're a doujin artist you've done porn in the past but they seem to try to create a new identity for themselves it's almost like the company that's hiring them now says we cannot have you affiliated at all with what you've done previously so right i mean oishi her website is essentially down no longer exists she's not done any doujinsi and god how long yeah we don't and that's just kind of what happens so it'll be interesting to see how certain projects progress do they continue and then if they do then what do we say that it isn't him so i don't know right so i think right now it's the is it possible it's certainly very possible we've seen plenty of these things happen in the past is it likely maybe likely can we say for sure we really can and i don't think anyone's going to give us an exact confirmation on that until some point down the line if at ever and it's just one of those things we inadvertently confirm somehow Mm -hmm. So I think this is where it's going to go for now. There seems to be a hint that there might be some more in the next issue. I, I don't know. I grabbed the November issue. It'll show up at some point. Uh, I guess I'm going to be buying the next couple months of each jump I assume it's going to show up in the next and be continued. The only issue is it doesn't. It just says to be continued. And right. Leaves it at that. It, what does that you mean? You know, a lot of times in in weekly Shonen Jump at the very bottom, it'll say, you know, give you a preview of what's going to happen in the next chapter, and it'll tell you when it's coming out or if it's going to go on a break. This just leaves it wide open, so who knows? But I think it is pretty likely. It's two pages. Yeah, and yeah. It's in it's in a monthly anthology, so it's not like it's a weekly magazine. And they're really heavily pushing Heroes. Heroes has been getting. A lot of extra merchandise and extra tie-ins. And that's something I've always wanted to talk about because of all the arcade games that have ever come out that we've seen, Heroes by far is just, I mean, they've taken it to the next level in a campaign of advertising. Yeah, they really have. They've tied it into anything they possibly can. They've created short anime films for it. Now we have manga. They have cards. I mean, you name it, they've done it. Other things have had merchandise. But we've never really had all these really well animated, even commercial shorts yeah, that yeah. are, you know, three minutes long. Mm-hmm. It's it's mind blowing. Yeah, they'll do full length versions of each Galaxy Mission kind of promo video. And then the 10 or 15 second version will pop up as a commercial somewhere. And But the thing is, like, this doesn't affect anyone outside of japan and that's what makes this really really sad because it's not like we could even import the game or anything other than the upcoming ultimate mission on 3ds which is going to be region locked anyway because the 3ds is region locked this it kind of sucks man i want to jump into the heroes world a little bit i'll be a merchandise whore let me help you namka bandai i want to give you my money i'm holding it 
and I want to give it over to you, but you won't let me. So I don't know what to make of heroes. It's it's weird. Why is there not a heroes TV show? Come on, guys. You know, it is one of those things we, we talked about even at the end of Kai. Yeah. This this would be something that actually would have been really cool if they would have done. Yeah. To to tie in an arcade game completely with a new series. And you could almost go to the arcade every week and play the episode you just watched. I know. I know. Like, would that not be like the coolest thing ever? We're writing their profit margins into their business plan right now. Come on, guys. We got this all figured out. We are happy to consult for a nominal fee. Because we is super smart. We, we is super smart. Uh, what else do we have for news? There's that. There's the movie stuff. Oh, I guess this is just kind of like a, one of those little clarification things we do. But is Comic-Con over? No, Comic-Con's not until October. But uh, Funimation, no DBZ. Yeah, which is kind of sad. I, I was really hoping there might be something. But, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, this is going to be the time when they announce something about the movie or episode of Bardock or are they going to dub this? And, you know, I really wish they would come out and say, yes, we're doing this stuff. Oh, we did get the Jump Super 8, you know, tour, anime tour special. We're dubbing it. It's already dubbed. Here it is. You know, here's a clip. Yeah. But unfortunately, it seems like the con season is going to be wrapping up soon and we're not really going to get a whole lot. Yeah, AWA was this weekend. It looked like Sentai was announcing some little thing every two minutes, but nothing really from Funimation to speak of. And they flat out told you that, nope, no Dragon Ball at Comic-Con, so no one get your hopes up for anything. I think this year is going to wrap up. And I think we've talked about this. That's probably a good move right now overall, just coming off the Blu-ray cancellation suspension. Maybe it's time to lay quiet as much as we want all this other stuff, especially news about the movie. But if the movie's not coming out until March 30th, they have a, a full quarter of 2013 the first part of the year to get involved and hype people up if they're going to do anything with it so we well, got plenty I, of time i think it gives funimation a good not only a good break from the series itself you know from oversaturating any market yeah but it also gives them time to really work on a lot of their other franchises and yeah they are more, more than more dragon going. ball <laughs> yeah believe it or so, not I think I think it'll be a good break for everyone all around because if you like other series, you're probably going to start to get a lot more of those, which you already are. I mean, they're knee deep in One Piece right now. Anyway, they're yeah. what arc are they doing? There's the after Skypea. What's after Skypea? Um, God, Water, Water Seven. Water Seven. Water Seven. Yeah. That's what they're doing right now. So let's see. Cool. Look at that. We're like One Piece experts. <laughs> yeah, but not really. I has read some mangas. I. I haven't read One Piece in over a year and a half, I think. Really? They hit they hit that like time skip where Luffy was gonna go train. Yeah, yeah. And I said, you know what? I'm holding off. I think Jake and I made a pact that we were gonna wait. And then at one point we're going to sit down and marathon like, gonna the entire thing. Wait for it to finish at this point. You have plenty of time. Yeah. I have I'm still waiting for because I've been reading at the not at the library, but next town over has a giant selection of one piece but they haven't gotten anything new so i'm still halfway through thriller bark and i, I want to read the rest yeah i would get past thriller bark it's I tough would. it's like i want to support it and i would just buy it but the library's got it and i'm so invested in the library having it that i don't know i almost feel like i should buy myself an ipad and get viz's app just to get it there because i'm starting to hit the point of i don't want physical manga anymore that is kind of sad except for dragon ball but yeah yeah definitely all right we're off the charts here in terms of relevance <laughs> no it's still sort of relevant i mean fizz has their manga app all of dragon balls there and if you don't so have go space get that, you can get it there know. too that's cool uh that's oh here we go one last bit of news that we haven't posted about heath i think we we should post this we are not the experts on dragon ball online i wish we were i would love to do more with it the problem as we've talked about is that none of us are fluent in Korean. So going to the primary source is very difficult for all of us. But folks have been sharing recent information about Dragon Ball Online, and it looks like Captain Bacterian is doing something with bringing a new villain that seems to be a form of cell into the mix here in Dragon Ball Online. I'm going to bring down the... the uh, image here this just gets crazier and crazier every time i hear dragon ball online updates yeah uh our buddy the devil's corpse uh i guess sent over the picture to a friend who knows korea if we have any folks from korea that like are super excited and want to 
do mass translation for us. We'd love to hear you. Uh, anyway, the shadowy picture here, the translation says, Do you remember me? Cell's descendants. Captain Bacterian's true aims or goals are being revealed. So it's like this buff cell thing. His head is weird. Like he's got two sets of his Pope things. One looks like perfect form and one looks like kind of first formish popping out of the back. And he's got like a Tony Stark thing in his chest there. And I he looks like he has four legs. Um, he's kind of frightening. You mean awesome looking? I mean awesome looking and frightening. Yeah, that's what I thought. So um, I think I'll, I'll post this up uh, before we post the podcast so you can see it on the homepage of the site as well. That's the extent of what I know right now. I would love to dive more into this. But again, we want to go to the primary source, which is the game in Korean, which is very difficult for all of us. So um, help please yeah apparently you think he's awesome is that all we have to say about it right now i don't know how else you would describe him but awesome and how you did with all the words and the whatnot <laughs> with the words and the whatnot and the who from poo we've got a few folks that uh i mean we have an ongoing dragon ball online thread it's up to 68 pages right now and uh there's a lot of people that are very very interested and very very involved with it playing it and doing what they can with it and taking screenshots and sharing things. It looks like there's a lot of really cool stuff in this game with, I mean, Bacterian's back. That's kind of cool. He was a guy. Who doesn't love Bacterian? Um, I believe you're a communist if you don't like Bacterian. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, we done with the news? No offense to all you communists out No, no. We, we welcome you. all of our commie comrades. You are welcome to listen to the show and enjoy in prosperity with all of us together. Uh, Heath, are we done with the news? I think we are. All right. So you're going to run away for a while. I'm going to talk to Joe about Super Butoden games for like an hour, and it's awesome. And uh, then we're going to come back and wrap it up. Sounds good to me. Joining me to jump back into the olden days of Dragon Ball video games it is that time of year. It's the video game Dragon Ball extravaganza, the Kappa from space, Mr. Joe Walker. Welcome back to the show. It's been, oh my God, has it been almost a year? Is that when Ultimate Tenkaichi was out? Not quite a year ago, right? Yeah, just about, I think. I don't Man. know. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, at least on my side, purge those memories. I actually saw the box the other day. I was like, what the hell is that? Th oh, right, right. That game, that game. I still think it was pretty good. Have you popped it in since last year? That's a big question. Uh, no, I have not. All right, then. <laughs> <laughs> we we have re-reviewed Ultimate Tenka Ichi right here. Well, welcome back to the show, man. I'm glad you're here because I know you are from my era of these games and Dragon Ball enjoyment. So I need someone to basically, you know how this show is. I need someone to come on the show and parrot my opinions back at me so I feel good. And so the authority of the show remains in check. Hey, anytime you need that, I'm here for you. I appreciate that so much. So, dude, you and I, we are going to jump back to the Butoden day of Dragon Ball video games. We're going to focus on the main three, one, two, and three on the Super Famicom. But we will, of course, mention, dive a little bit into some of the offshoots on what would be the Mega Drive, the Sega Genesis, the Saturn, and believe it or not, the Nintendo DS. You wouldn't think that Butoden extends that far into the future, the future being last year, but it kind of did. So because it's been so long since we last talked to you, Maybe people have no idea who you are. Give me a little bit of background. What is your history with the series and why should I consider you a quasi authority on the Super Butoden series? Uh, geez. Well, my history with the series goes way back. Um, I started watching it probably in 1994 in raw Japanese. So you are one of the fabled pre-Funimation folks. I am. I, I did some date matching and I think I got into it after Funimation had kind of picked it up but i was completely unaware of what they were doing with it yeah well in 94 they existed solely as a company it's not like they were doing anything yet 95 they started dubbing the original dragon ball and then 96 was dbz so even if you're anytime around there you're still pretty awesome yeah see i was watching it you know raw on international channel getting my fan subs from the internet so I go, I go way back. I hear you, man. Good times. But yeah, um, I've been playing the Super Batoden games 
almost about as long as I've been into the show. Um, a buddy of mine had gone to Hawaii in, I think it was like mid-1994, and came back because they had a big, you know, a lot of Japanese import stores there. Well, it was big. Hawaii in particular had Nippon Golden Network, which was airing, I believe they did Dr. Slump. They did the entirety of the original Dragon Ball TV series, and then they did one through, I believe it was exactly episode 100 of Dragon Ball Z. It was the first official licensed subtitled broadcast of Dragon Ball Z in North America. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah, um, he came back with uh, Super Butoden 2, and we just played the hell out of it, and I've been into the series since then. Ah, that's such a good memory. So I guess maybe this is kind of a closing thought, but I almost want to open with it. Do you feel, because I kind of feel this way, and again, I need you to parrot my opinions and my feelings back at me. Do you feel like the Super Butoden series, the series of the three games in particular, and everything about them are almost this like parallel universe of what DBZ is to you? It really is. And I think that's part of why I like them so much is because as I play these games, I remember the feelings of discovering the series. So they feel very just pure to me in a way. Mm, yeah, yeah. And it's it's nostalgia, but it's kind of beyond that where it's I don't even know how to pure is probably the best word to describe it. It's like there's no other way to describe what those feelings and those thoughts and those no preconceptions at the time were back then. And everything was so fresh and it was in this crazy moon language. You had no idea what was going on, but you still right. kind of figured it out. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had talked about which one of us is going to get to play as Vegeta. So, I mean, that should tell you. <laughs> That should tell you how little we actually knew at the time. I love it. Like, no one had pieced together the names and the puns or anything. Oh, right. And then you look back at it now, you go, really? I said that? Yeah, that happens a lot. We all had that. We all had that. I, I believed that Napa's name was Nama because I couldn't remember for the longest time. So, I mean... I had those instances, too. We just don't think about those days very much. No, no, no. So let's talk about these games. I, I kind of want to go in chronological order for the three main Super Butoden games on the Super Famicom, and then we'll talk about some of the other stuff, and maybe we'll mix things in here and there. Dragon Ball had already had a large presence in the video game world. Uh, I know Heath and I were recently mentioning this uh, Epoch cassette system was really the first Dragon Ball video game, but then it jumped onto the Famicom with uh, The Mystery of Shenlong. There were all these card-based battle strategy exploration kind of games. Then we jumped to the Super Famicom. Super Butoden was not the first Super Famicom game. The first one was actually Super Saiya Densetsu, or The Legend of the Super Saiya Saiyan. The Legend of the Legendary Super Saiyan of Legend. Legend, Legend legend exactly so and that was an rpg so that's really how dragon ball started that was uh the prior year in 92 i believe it was march 20th 1993 we have super butoden making its appearance on the super famicom and it's actually the first true fighting game for the franchise ever if you it's like this little asterisk here there was also that uh, barcode battlers game on the Famicom that was sort of a fighting game, but it's not the type of fighting game that we think of when we say the words fighting game. This was really it. So you started with Super Butoden 2, but you have played the first game. So it's kind of this strange coloring. I have the same thing where it's I went backward in time. So we don't have a fresh, pure perspective on the first Super Butoden, but I guess we'll try to do it as best we can. Uh, I kind of want to start with the characters and how everything starts off. Uh, in terms of a roster initially playable, we have Goku, Vegeta, number 20, slash Dr. Gero, number 16, Piccolo, Kududin, number 18, Cell in his first form. And then there are some unlockable characters. Standard for Dragon Ball, you get Super Saiyan forms of a whole bunch of people. We got Trunks, Gohan, uh, Goku, Vegeta, but also Perfect Cell into the mix there. Uh, are you familiar with the code unlocking method for the these characters in the first game? I know I've done it, but I couldn't tell you the code off the top of my head. Okay. For this one, it's really weird. It, at least the way that I remember it is you have to hold L and R, and it's on the like opening screen where it's kind of showing the story and everything, and you just kind of start with up and X and just start rotating all the buttons on both the left and the right side counterclockwise, and eventually you hear a sound and Goku's voice, and that's how you do it. It's really weird. Yes, I remember having some trouble with that, actually. All right, and well, that's how you get the extra characters. Where I want to start with this game is this really fascinated me. The story mode to the game, you're already in the story mode on the title screen of the game. When you hit story mode, go, the menu flies away. Goku and Piccolo are already there on the screen. You just start fighting. Like, you go. 
And I thought that was, it kind of blew me away. Like, wow, we're just into the mix. Today's technology, today's consoles, you know, you pop in the game. All right, I got to do the 1.01 patch and then I got to wait for all the menus to load and all the sponsor screens and everything. This was press start. You're in the game. Yeah, and it was actually really cool because I feel like that kind of fit the tone of the series as well. Yeah, it did. It's just, you know, fast paced in your face. Here it is. Go, which was actually really, really cool at the time. And uh, this is one of the rare games that acknowledges the original uh, Dragon Ball TV series slash the first part of the manga where Goku versus Piccolo. This is obviously the 23rd Tenkaichi Budoka. A couple other games have done this where they start here and then move onward. Most recently being, um, Attack of the Science on the Nintendo DS. So it's sort of the 23rd Budokai, but not really, because it's really just Piccolo from later, even though it's the same Piccolo. But all right, so the gameplay of Super Buto Den. Joe, go. What do you got? I, this is not going to be kind here, I, I'm sure. I mean, I don't know how I would feel if I had played it before the others, but trying to play it after playing later games in the series, it's just a slow, sloppy, clunky mess. It's almost unplayable. I mean, I, I started playing the Goku versus Piccolo and I lost and then I played it again. I just standard difficulty and I lost. I'm like, I don't know if I want to play anymore. <laughs> yeah. Cause there's a whole flying into your opponent thing and knocking them down. And then they right, stay right. down for like eight years and <laughs> your, your key builds so slowly. And I didn't even know there was a way to build your key manually until five minutes ago. Reading the, <laughs> Did you reading read about the game? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You have to go up into the air, right? Right. Yeah, and then hold the down button. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was just it wasn't great to put it kindly. It's got a lot of good stuff going for it. I feel like it's got an appropriate roster of characters. You have everyone for what is really the cell arc of the series. You got Frieza in the mix there. Oh no, do you not even have Frieza in the game here? I don't think you do. No, Frieza's uh, not here. Look. I'm looking at the character select screen and it says Frieza. Oh, it does. I just forgot to write his name there on the list. Okay, so Frieza's in there too. So it's yes. another one of those best of Frieza and Cell Arc kind of uh, rosters here. Yeah, that's actually the greatest thing about it is just how varied the roster is. Because you've got, you know, the artificial humans and you've got the science and then you've got, you know, Piccolo and some enemies thrown in there. Yeah, you got Dr. Garrow in there. I mean, he's not the most popular, greatest, most interesting character, but if you're going to have an extra random dude he's pretty okay yeah he's he's different he's a, a unique flavor we yeah, yeah. say i don't know what else we can say about it i kind of just want to jump to the music immediately because i feel this is one of the only things that the game really has going for it what i love about the soundtrack to the first super butoden game is all the characters have their own unique themes and a lot of them are great but the entire soundtrack to the game has this one underlying bass beat to it and I believe every song has something like this. Do, 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 do. And it's present in, if not all of the character themes, the vast majority of them. And it really ties everything about the game together. It's got this consistent whole kind of feel to it because of that. Yeah, that unified feel just really it because I actually have the arranged album and I listen to it a lot start yeah, to finish yeah. because it just has a great flow because the songs are like they're all different. They all, you know, kind of have like their own different vibe to them. But that underlying bass beat really just kind of helps it make it feel like a complete album rather than okay this is Goku's song and this is Frieza's song and right. just and throw we, them all together. We get a lot of that and even the next game that we'll talk about has that and there's some amazing songs in there but it feels very disjointed Right. and I guess let's talk about the arranged version of the album uh, mixing in character samples in there. I like Frieza's theme in the game. It's okay. The arranged version of Frieza's theme I think just is, is spectacular that the way it crackles at the beginning that do 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 do
Yamamoto did some good stuff back then. Yeah, and that's my thing when I listen to this. I'm like, I know I should be disappointed in you, but man, this is awesome. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like this is his chance. I mean, we don't know about this game in particular. Maybe there is some stuff in here that came from another place, and we'll get to that. As far as I know, the soundtrack to the first game is clean. Doesn't mean it is. (laughs) As far as I know, it is. And I think part of that is he was constraining himself with that underlying beat to the song. So he had to pull things together in a way that he didn't have to do in all of his later work so it's one of those things where when you have constraints I feel like you're able to do more interesting and maybe better work than if you just have like oh I can just play CD music whatever yeah that makes sense I don't know what else to say about this first game it's kind of a mess other than the presentation the graphics are okay it's a little dark it's a little muddy they improve on that over time but it's not that spectacular of a game. Yeah, it doesn't really look like they were pushing the Super Nintendo or Super Famicom that hard with this one. No, no, not at all. I mean, there's so many other games in the works. They're putting out more than one game a year. Let's talk about that right now. A lot of people... I mean, we talk about this where every October, every November, there's a new Dragon Ball Z video game ready for your PS3 and your 360 and prior to that to the the PS2. The same thing was happening back then. Remember, Super Butoden 1, March 20th, 1993. Super Butoden 2, December 17th, 1993. That same year, we're talking like nine-ish months, not even a full calendar year that next game was out. The same BS was happening back then. And I feel like in retrospect, Respect, we give it a little bit of a pass, but I wonder if that's just because Super Butoden 2 was such a marked improvement over the first game. It almost seems like Super Butoden 1 was kind of like a beta or a <laughs> demo of what they wanted to do. Yeah, totally. And like, I ah, just put way. it out, it'll sell. Yeah, yeah. But that's crazy. Like, it was the same year. And this one at least got out for Christmas just in time. But you think about that now. If we had Sparking Neo in March and Meteor in November, December, there would be far more of an outcry than there was just from November to November. Yeah, but I think back then the video game market was different where you didn't get as many games in a year. And you didn't know when they came out either. I mean, well, Japan was very different because we know exact release dates for every game ever released in Japan. Unlike right. the US, where we're like, is Zelda 2 out? No. Is Zelda 2 out? No. Six months later, is Zelda 2 out? Maybe? We don't know. Right, yeah. It was it was a different time, a simpler time, we'll say. I guess what's important to say is that this was, of course, not the only Dragon Ball game that year. Obviously, the first game was earlier that year. But uh, Plan to Eradicate the Science was released on the Famicom that year as well. So they were still supporting the uh, original Nintendo Entertainment System, the Famicom family computer over there, simultaneously alongside the Super Famicom. I think a lot of people forget just how popular the first system continued to be. Uh, I know over in the U.S., we like Kirby's Adventure really helped it keep going. And uh, you're the right person to talk about this with. Was uh, Lion King one of the last, if not the last, uh, normal licensed NES games? And that was pretty late. Did that even come out on NES? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it did. Huh. I'm pretty sure there's a Lion King game on NES. So, I mean, that's how popular the NES of Famicom continued to be. But they're trying to shift the attention over here, so it's kind of weird. Right, uh, yeah. So, Super Butoden 2. Uh, let's talk about characters here. We start off with, not Goku, we have Gohan, Cell, Vegeta, Cell Jr., Trunks, obviously future Trunks here, Zangya, and Bojack, both of them from DBZ Movie 9, and Piccolo to round out the mix. Not immediately selectable, unlockable characters in the game. Goku and Broly. The balls on the developers of this game. Can you believe it that Goku is not an immediately selectable character in the game? And I fucking love it for that. It's actually... It, I like, I mean, of course, when it came out, I didn't even realize because I didn't know who Goku was. But looking back on it now, <laughs> it's like, wow, I can't imagine this people's faces when they pop that in being like okay well where is he like it's, it's dragon ball Where, where's goku i don't, right, I don't yeah. understand well you know toriyama wanted gohan to be the hero all along <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> we have a section for you about that <laughs> <laughs> But I love it because uh, Super Butonan 1, focusing really on the Cell arc, I mean, when you have the two different forms of Cell in there and all the super versions of the characters from that era, yeah, Freeze is there, but it's mostly the artificial humans and Cell. This is the end of Cell and movie 9. And for like a mainline game to so heavily focus on 
that tiny little era, really just this tiny portion of the main series and then a movie. I love it. It's just such a, a focused session and it gave them a chance to do some interesting stuff in terms of a story mode. We didn't really talk about the story mode with uh, the first game. I didn't play far into it ever. I've played throughout the entirety of Super Butoden 2 and I'm sure you have as well. You've got things like, well, sells over and then Bojack is here and then Broly breaks in at the end like there's some cool stuff that they do here and you're like wandering around at, to different areas looking and then you spar for a Super Famicom game I thought it was a pretty involved story mode yeah it gives the game a, a lot of character because it it kind of moved away from just being like okay well it's you know, another game with Goku and friends. It was like, well, here's the Dragon Ball story that we want to tell. We're not just going to rely on Goku. Right, right. Which was a very brave decision to make, but I feel like in the end it served them well and it made a better game. Yeah, and like we were saying, I think it's more brave, more bold in retrospect than it was at the time because for the time it was, well, yeah, Goku's out of the picture, so this kind of makes sense for the time frame. Yeah, and I mean, when as soon as you turn on the game, you've got Goku saying, it, it's your turn, Gohan. Yeah. So, Oh, I always love that. The samples at the beginning there. The, oh, yeah. My no to Bonda. Go on. And then Gohan's flying toward um, God's palace up there. And just oh, the, the opening theme that. Doo -doo, doo -doo. Oh, my heart. <laughs> All right. So I guess we're going to talk about the music here before we even talk about the gameplay. One of my first forays into the dark underworld of Kenji Yamamoto. I've told the story many times working at Blockbuster, manager pops on Pink Floyd live concert while his sells Super Butoden 2 theme playing on this video here. So there's instances here. Amazing soundtrack overall, though. It's one of those things where Kenji Yamamoto did stuff, but he's a very talented arranger, even if he's not a talented composer. Yeah. So give me some of your thoughts on the uh, Butoden 2 soundtrack here. I, I love it. Gohan's theme from Super Butoden 2 is actually one of my favorite video game songs of all time. Just the basic piano piece. That doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, I love it. And, you know, I know I should vary the songs when I play, but whenever I'm actually playing, I just set it to that song because that song is just kind of synonymous with the game for me. And what's really interesting is that's one of the songs, one of the only songs from this game that carried forward was featured in, I know it was in Shin Butoden. Uh, I want to say it was also in Ultimate Battle 22 as one of the, like, Sweet the Five Warriors kind of things. I think it uh, was, yeah. A sped up version of it, which I prefer the sped up version myself but but uh no overall it's a great soundtrack i mean everybody's got their own themes um you know vegeta has another one of my favorites from that from that game vegeta all three butoden games gets amazing music well you know he's vegeta yeah he's gotta have it but um this is another one where i've got the arranged soundtrack and right. i listen to it an awful lot because it just it <laughs> lends itself to it so well and it's only 10 tracks i think it is the arranged soundtrack um i don't think cell jr has his own maybe he does in the he game doesn't. i don't remember no no okay. he doesn't he doesn't in the game so I, I i was listening to the arranged one earlier so i'd remember yeah as i'm looking down the I, list i think no, i would remember i know everyone else's themes bojack's yeah. got the it's like it feels like a pirate song and when you look at the character design if you weren't already thinking pirate it kind of comes to fruition there in your head yeah, yeah. It's yeah. kind of a weird track, but I understand it. Um, Zongia's, I think, is actually really cool, too, although it's, the arranged version, at least, is very, very feminine and flowery, and it's like, did you it guys is. watch Movie 9? <laughs> like, she's kind of a badass. Yeah. She's smiling and snarky about it, but she's kind of a badass, so yeah. I would have liked that, too. All right, so we talked about the character roster and the music. We got to talk about the gameplay of Super Buto N2. Really stepped up its game here. It's responsive. It moves fast. There's still a little bit of floatiness going on, and I don't always buy some of the hit detection in the game. But overall, you're thinking, they did this in nine months while making other games? How is this possible? Yeah, and it plays very different from any other fighter I've ever played. Oh, it totally does. That's part of why I like it. And I mean, it is floaty and it is a little bit slow, but I like that it's not a combo-based fighter. And 
I feel like the way it is now is it's kind of almost like a chess match where you kind of wait to see what your opponent's going to do to see what you can counter with because with most special moves, you do a special move, your opponent gets knocked down, you reset, okay, well now what's going to happen? And it makes it really enjoyable to play, especially with, you know, two players and you're not just playing against the computer because it's there's a lot of mind games going on and it's just, it's, it's a lot of fun. I like that description. We think in this game, there's a little bit of the, well, I'm just going to fly away and charge up my key and then I'll figure out what to do. That gets really bad in some of the later generation games. I think in this game, it's fast enough and you have the dashes that you can use that flying away to charge up your key isn't a guarantee that you're safe. There's a lot that you can do in the meantime to counter someone doing that. And I feel like there's still a lot of hand to hand combat that's going to go on. Right. Everyone's got these nice kind of long, relatively well animated combos Gohan's got he's always got one that ends with his kind of signature jet uppercut uh, I think it's a toss back to what he used against Cell when um, before he started spitting up number 18 uh, Trunks has some stuff where he does like a backhand kind of thing and ends with kind of this uppercut thing as well and they're it's weird because they don't have this great range so you really have to be on top of your opponent to connect with that stuff and everything else is still a little bit slow but i'm still so super impressed of what they were able to do between these two games yeah and i mean like the hit detection if you kick somebody like they're gonna be kind of stuck in that hit for a few minutes or, <laughs> or a few seconds i guess it's not oh, that slow. Th- th- i know this drives you nuts too after you do something like that and you knock them away from you my inclination is always all right they're, they're flying away i'm gonna charge up my key except it doesn't start charging your key for like four seconds because it's kind of stuck in animation loops and figuring out what to do right drives me up the wall especially like if someone flies up above you and then keep passing over you both <laughs> I know, back it and just forth. goes like blah 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 you can't do like, anything what the hell's going on <laughs> But no, okay, it's, so it's not just me. Good. No, no, no. It's just there's there's so much to do. And I mean, like you said, running away and charging your key isn't safe. Everybody's got those, you know, homing key attacks. It, I don't know. I think it was just a well thought out fighter. It was. And uh, I don't remember how much of this was in the first game. I know you could um, like cancel out and dodge some of the super moves, but it's so much more responsive in this game where you can, what are you going to do? Are you going to counter the super move? Are you going to block and take the damage? You just have these little windows of opportunities to do stuff. And it felt like it actually worked for once. That all being said, I can recognize this still kind of a wonky fighting game. Oh, definitely. It, it's definitely not perfect. It's still very, very rough around the edges, but I, I think that it still comes out on top like as a fun game. You can look past the flaws because everything else was done so well. Yeah, there's so much care put into this game in every other aspect that uh, I think we overlook the they're, they're still working on the <laughs> fighting mechanics. We're going to jump ahead now to Super Butoden 3, even though another game came out in the meantime, but we'll jump back to that. So we're talking, what's the timeline here? Super Butoden 1, March 20th, 1993. Super Butoden 2, December 17th, 1993. Super Butoden 3, September 29th, 1994. So again, not quite a full year and there's some other stuff in the meantime on other systems. This was an interesting case. For me, Super Butoden 3 meant a lot to me, even though I love Super Butoden 2 more. It was the first Super Famicom game that I owned, the first import Dragon Ball game that I owned. I owned it cartridge only. I believe it was Otakon 2000 that I picked it up, and I'd obviously been farting around on emulators before that as well, though. But Super Butoden 3, it's this weird full upgrade and full sequel to the prior game but also like three steps back at the same time yeah it's just i mean they they did so much more in some areas but then in everything else it was just so much less than super butoden 2 i mean you've got like what is it uh 10 characters yeah let, let's go over the roster so there's nine initially selectable we've got goku gohan trunks kaioshin majin Buu, the fat good mr boo uh dabra vegeta and number 18 it's funny how number 18 she's in all three games wait no no she's not in super Batoden too is she no she's not in there never mind no nah, the token girl slot was taken by zongyo and it, zongyo is in there okay and then we have an unlockable character and that's future trunks or just trunks in all caps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the unlockable one. And uh, he carries over a remix of his theme from Super Butoden 2. Uh, I know one of our earliest episodes back in like 2005 or maybe early 2006 is, why does Trunks get all the great music in all the video games? So I can't vouch for the sound quality on that episode back then, but good content in there. Yeah. 
It's a good song. It is a good song. Uh, so that's our roster here. We're downgrading from the prior game when you take all the unlockables and everything into consideration. So we've got less characters. We've got less background stages. That's for damn sure. And a couple are just like night versions of their regular selves. And there's no story mode whatsoever in Super Butoden 3. There's just the Tenka Ichibudokai and the verses and the options. Go. Yeah, it's just, I mean, you've got, what is it, 10 characters and seven of them have yellow hair. <laughs> it's just, it's not as interesting, even though, you know, we love these characters and everything. There's just, it, it, it seems like there's not as much variety because they all kind of look the same, you know. Yeah, th- this was that era where I was like, I was barely familiar with it. I had that uh, issue of EGM. I guess this would have been 1994. I know I've put the yes. scans up on the site. They had this giant preview section of Super Butoden 3. It was like six or eight pages, something like that, detailing all the characters, all the different moves. Uh, I remember for the longest time that I thought that number 18 and Crudidin had a son because that's what this preview from EGM said. It said they had a son. I had no idea. I was confused for the longest time. Oh, and it had that huge picture on the first page that they edited all the sprites into. Too, so it looked yeah. like they were fighting. Uh-huh. And, and Bobbity was in there, and I was like, who's that guy? I want to play as that guy. <laughs> well, his sprite's in the game. He just yeah. introduces Boo. But then, you know, we talked about the uh, like the stages. I mean, mm-hmm. there were 22 stages in Super Butoden 2. It goes down to 17 in this one, and they're really variations on maybe three or four different stages. With yeah. <laughs> This is nighttime, and this is sunset, and this is daytime. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a couple good ones, like inside Bobbity's spaceship. It's kind of always a, a good one to have. But you can't fly in that stage. No, <laughs> you're just stuck inside. That's it. Right. Yeah. So that's what's so tough about this game, because let's talk about all the improvements it did. I know the first thing I noticed when I played Super Butoden 3 was the super moves now had animation to them, where the blasts and the beams had these little sparkles and spiral things sparking around them while they were firing. That seemed at the time like such a huge improvement. But it's not just that. It's the speed of the game, the weight of the characters. Everything just felt it wasn't Street Fighter by any stretch of the imagination. Not that we would expect it to be exactly Street fighter but it felt like it was finally approaching this is a real fighting game like that you could play for reals now yeah i feel like it was a good like kind of stopgap in between you know what super butoden set up and then getting into more of a traditional street fighter type game right and then Um, they switched generations of systems and almost had to start over and then they did three entirely different games but uh no it was so much faster it was a lot more fluid uh i mean super butoden 2 to charge your key all the way up from nothing to full was probably about 20 seconds of charging forever and you had the two levels i don't remember if you have the two levels in three as well i think it's just one i could be wrong but uh wait i think was it two levels in super butoden 1 or super butoden 2 i don't think there's two levels in super butoden 2 maybe there's not i don't know i've played so many in such a short (laughs) period of time as much as you think you know these games when you're just playing them for a couple minutes each and like okay rip out the cart put in the next one yeah yeah. start running together again but uh no charging your key from start to finish in three takes about five seconds right which means more super moves but again because everything's so much more responsive i feel like i can counter them more appropriately doing the quarter circle and then the what's it like down back forward and then the the key button to do some of the counters it it just works. Finally, everything just works. Yeah, so being able to charge up faster made it so you could fire them off more often. And I feel like after you fired one, it gave your opponent a smaller window to react. So it, yeah, yeah. it kind of upped the tension and it made it less of... It, it wasn't really like a slog to get through the, the super moves. It made them a lot more impactful, a lot more tense and made it feel like, okay, well, he fired it off. I got to do something now. I guess let's uh, jump back to the presentation a little bit. Um, Overall, very similar to Super Butoden 2 in terms of the graphics themselves. Characters all look very similar, just Boo Arc versions. I want to talk about the music, though. You know, we got less characters, less stages. We have less music. I think there was only, what was it, seven background musics to choose from. So it's not per character anymore, with the exception of a couple. Like I mentioned, Trunks from Super Butoden 2. He's got a remix of his theme. Uh, Vegeta's, what is ostensibly Vegeta's theme, because it's named as such when it's recycled in later games, which I think is one of my favorite tunes in all of Dragon Dragon Ball video game history. I, 
I feel like Super Butoden 3 is when Yamamoto and company hit a modern stride that would carry over into the entire next generation of systems. And obviously 94, this is when the PlayStation and the Saturn were released anyway. And the Playdia was also released. Next generation of systems here. <laughs> I feel like he... He was using the Super... And the Super Famicom had an amazing uh, sound... Uh, it was a Sony sound device inside their uh, sound chip soundboard they had. He was pumping s such great stuff out of it that it transitioned into that next generation with the Red Book audio. And like I'm kind of in awe at Yamamoto sometimes where I have these two sides. Like, this little angel Yamamoto over here and this little devil <laughs> Yamamoto over here. And it's like, I arrange things so well. Don't you love Vegeta's theme? And the other one is like just listening to Pink Floyd and like prodding me in the ear every once in a while. But you know, I I was just playing Super Butoden 3 yesterday uh -huh. and I could tell you that the music is good. I could not hum a single tune from it, if you ask. It's not really? like Super Butoden 2 where like I, I know the whole soundtrack. It's just I agree. It, it was just kind of there. It it didn't it, it, it didn't feel like the soundtrack was like as much a part of the game as it was in Super Toten 2. Right, and I think that's because it's less per character, less per stage. I feel like not all of them are standout tracks other than Trunks' and Vegeta's. But then when I hear them, I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I know this. Wait, I think I also know it because then it showed up in Shin Butoden, and I think this one's also in Final Bout, too. Like, it stuck around that long. So they kind of just exist in my mind rather than being so heavily associated with this game. Yeah, yeah. Anything else about Super Butoden 3? It's so weird because we lost the story mode and we lost everything in so many areas, but it was like 90% competent as a fighting game. Yeah, and I get why there's no story mode because, I mean, the story was still going on at the time, but not having the story mode makes it feel like much less of a game. Well, then we talk about things like Raging Blast 2 didn't have a story mode, but it had an entire single player campaign, for lack of a better word. Where right. you had all these different things and unlockables and collectibles. Not that collectathons were huge back in, well, maybe they were back in Mario World and Donkey Kong Country. It wasn't as bad as when we hit the Nintendo 64 days, but oh yeah, I feel like they could have done something, but was it just that their attention was the next generation of systems and still on the Super Famicom? That could be. I mean, it's just the story mode is the Tenkaichi Budokai. I mean, that's the only way to see the credits is to, <laughs> yeah. beat, is to beat the Tenkaichi Budokai. So it's just it feels really just kind of like, ah, well, you know what? That's your single player campaign. Uh, uh, we would be remiss not to mention Hyper Dimension, which is not a Butoden game. It plays completely differently, like the life bars. And I mean, some of the gameplay is quasi similar, but you're not flying all over the place. I feel like Butoden is defined to me as split screen, charging up your key and your life is separate from that key meter. And I don't know what else would define a Butoden game for you. Uh, Gohan's theme from Super Butoden 2. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, no, every, you, you're right on everything. It's just, they're still unlike any other fighter that has ever come out. And, you know, there's been lots of other Dragon Ball games, like you mentioned, Hyper Dimension, that are very unique. But this was a series that took an idea and evolved it over three games, which I think helps it stand out and be more memorable. Right. Because you, we, watch, we didn't watch it evolve, but we went back and played all three of them and then saw the differences. And saw that evolution. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're, we're kind of in that 32-bit era, but we got to jump back a little bit. In between Super Butoden 2 and Super Butoden 3 was a little game on the Sega Mega Drive, or as we got the Genesis, Buyu Retsuden. Basically, the Sega version of Super Butoden. I mean, it, there's no Butoden in the title, but it's a Butoden game. Yep. And I love this. It was released on April 1st in 1994. What a cruel joke. <laughs> uh, this is another one of those where it's, well, what kind of era are they representing here? It's like early mid Frieza and here's some Cell stuff. We've got Goku, Vegeta, number 18, Kudadin, Raccoon, Ginyu, Piccolo, Cell, and Frieza. I love that. Raccoon and Ginyu. I feel like the only other game that did that was like Ultimate Battle 22 where it's Zarbon and... Raccoon and Ginyu. Yeah, and wasn't this the only game that uh, Kudadin was in until Ultimate Battle 22? I think so. Yeah, so I mean, that was cool, but that's Oh no, he was, was in cool. Super Butoden 1, I think. 
Was he? Uh, let me look down the list. Do I see his name there? No, I see Vegeta. I, I wrote, I think I wrote his name instead of Frieza's name. Oh. Yeah, I'm looking yeah, at the title okay. screen. Yeah, he's not there. <laughs> yeah. Mike trying to quickly read Kana, <laughs> being like, oh, I recognize that. Oh, wait, that's wrong. So this game is kind of a clusterfuck. It's awful. The only things I can really tell you about this game that I remember where I tore the crap out of my thumbs trying to play it because oh, it's the awful. controls are so bad. Especially on the the original three button Genesis pad. Like it's just oh. not conducive to playing fighting games as no. anyone who tried to play Street Fighter in the Genesis knows. But yeah, it was just tearing up my thumbs and then if you leave it paused for a couple minutes, Bubbles walks across the screen. <laughs> well, I mean, it had a couple of good things like that. I, I do like the uh, after you lose. It's got Kaio and Bubbles there and they almost look like quasi 3D rendered sprites. It's kind of weird. Like the Genesis do doing some strange graphical stuff there. Yeah, it had a very interesting look. It definitely didn't look quite like the Butoden games. No, it, it looked like the Genesis version of right, a yeah. Super Nintendo game and all of the usual negative connotations that come along with that. And that's not to say, I mean, you and I are big Genesis fans as yes, well. I yes. know this for a fact. So we hold no spite or contempt for what Sega was doing at the time. But this just felt like a stopgap that they weren't learning from any of their improvements over on the Super Famicom. It's slow. It's clunky. It's got all that. In terms of presentation, just music alone, I feel like the only thing I know is the opening theme that do 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 do. And that's the only thing I could remember. And then you go to YouTube and you look at all the comments that are in, I think it's Spanish, Italian, and French. They all seem to love it and have the fondest memories of this. And that kind of blows me away. Well, this game was actually released in France when it, like, when it came out. Didn't yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I believe a couple, if not all, of these Super Famicom games were as well. They kind of got some good stuff back then, whereas we jumped from Dragon Power to Final Bout. Yeah, yeah, that's a big leap. But I think this was just kind of like, okay, well, we need to put out a game on the Mega Drive, and they didn't really put much thought into it beyond that. I think that's why the character roster is so varied, too. It's like, well, this is going to be our only game, so might as well put all these guys in here. And Raccoon? I don't know. I mean, I like Raccoon. Everybody likes Raccoon. All right. So there was that. <laughs> I, I, we kind of have to mention Ultimate Battle 22 before we talk about the next Butoden proper game. Even though Ultimate Battle 22 is, it's similar in many ways, but it's very dissimilar in all the other ways. You go back to what defines a Butoden game. For me, again, it's the split screen flying and kind of flying away from your opponent and charging. As soon as you drop that split screen, I feel like you've removed Butoden from the game. Yeah, and Ultimate Battle 22 was actually one of the first games I ever imported because it was when I discovered eBay and I was like, all right, I, I got to buy this. <laughs> nice. All right, here. What was your first purchase on eBay ever? Was it this? Uh, it was actually a Super Nintendo. Oh, the system itself? Yeah. Wow. All I, right. I was a Genesis kid. Oh, okay. All right. My first purchase was the uh, soundtrack to the uh, Me Too Strikes Back, the original Japanese soundtrack to the first Pokemon movie. Your first purchase is way cooler than mine. Yeah, it was. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but no, with Ultimate Battle 22, I remember playing it and I remember liking it because it was Dragon Ball and it was yeah, in Japanese yeah. and I had a great time with it because this was long before it ever came out in America. But I remember I was so used to Super Butoden and then you don't have that split screen anymore. So it took all... It took pretty much all of the weight and the power out of the super moves, and it just... Yeah, yeah. Because wasn't the Kamehameha, didn't it just turn it into like a big fireball? Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even a beam anymore? Was... I don't think so. It's been so long since I've played it. But that's the strange thing. It's like everything else about it feels like it would be Butoden. It's just these kind of slightly off-model 2D animations of the characters. And even though they made this big deal about them being animated, cell animated characters from the original artists and all that jazz, but everything just felt kind of off about yeah, it. Yeah, the, the scale didn't seem quite right. Right, right. So that's Ultimate Battle 22. There's a lot more we could say about it, but really we have to talk about Shin Butoden, which is kind of this remixed version of Ultimate Battle 22 that brought back in the Butoden elements. This came out November 17th, 1995. I feel like the instant you throw that split screen back in, you're like, okay, I'm good. I know how to handle myself here. Exactly. Like it. I mean, Ultimate Battle 22 was really just Butoden with, minus the stuff that made it Butoden. So it was really great to see Shin Butoden put that back. I mean, it had great music and those laughable animations in between fights that was cut from the American release. It had stuff going for it, but 
is kind of a mess. And then Shin Butoden comes around and it's still kind of a janky game. Not going to lie, but adding in the split screen and it's also got this thing where you can kind of knock your opponent and rotate the screen around um, like a quarter of a screen at the time. That introduced something new to the mix. My favorite thing about Shin Butoden is Mr. Satan mode. Yes. And it's crazy because I love a mode that is based off of DBZ Movie 11. How is that possible? And it's not the Bio Broly story. It's the Mr. Satan owes number 18 money. That's the story of Mr. Satan mode. But what's great about it is that these other characters are fighting. You're Mr. Satan by the side of the ring. You're throwing bananas. You're throwing health things. You're shooting them with a gun during the match. It's like they just took everything that was great about Butoden games and then added this awesome entire other story thing like okay this is why super butoden 3 didn't have much going for it they were clearly putting their work into all right the rough draft ultimate battle 22 final draft shin butoden i would buy a whole game that was just mr satan mode to be honest with you i know it's (laughs) awesome it's awesome and it's fully voice acted and everything is great oh yeah and they've never done anything like that again so it it makes it all the more memorable because Like, man, remember Mr. Satan mode? That was awesome. Uh, Have you played it recently, the game overall? Uh, I haven't. I mean, I'm going to lose a lot of my Sega cred, but I don't have a Saturn. So Ah, I want to buy one just for this game. Cancel call done. Right oh, here. Geez. No, I haven't popped in recently myself, so I'm kind of going on memory for all the other stuff about it. So I don't remember the control of the game as well as I should. From my memory, I feel like it wasn't as fast. I could totally be wrong. And the music was a little bit downsampled from how clear it was on the PlayStation version of Ultimate Battle 22. But on the flip side, you didn't have to enter a code for the five extra characters. Although the character select screen was really weird. Ultimate Battle 22 was just all the shadows of everyone. And you just, you know, left, right, up, down, cycle through them. Shin Butoden had them separated into like groups of three or four. Yeah, yeah. And then you would highlight between them and then go to the next. Like, I never understood that. What is the purpose of that design? That makes no sense to me. I was actually looking up this game not long ago and I I saw the title screen again and I was, I, I couldn't, I stared at it and I was like, what, who made that design choice? And who thought that was a good idea? Because <laughs> it's so weird. I hope they got fired. And the opening animation, which is this like my first digital edit. Of the Ultimate Battle 22 opening. Yeah. Yeah. It just... I don't know. I try not to think about that kind of stuff because I like so much about the rest of the game. Yes. Yes. So we're kind of leave that behind. Again, we want to mainly focus on the first three. There's one last thing to talk about, and I feel like I haven't given it the proper attention. Uh, I have folks bugging me about the final review. Where is it? Ultimate Butoden for the Nintendo DS released February 3rd, 2011. A recent game. I would talk. Uh, we didn't even mention the playable characters in Shin Butoden because there are 27 seven of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like math can do. Ultimate Butoden, there's like 50 characters or whatever. It's a modern Dragon Ball game. And Kaio, playable for the first time ever in a game. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, Kaio is playable. That's cool. So you haven't played Ultimate Butoden? No, no, I haven't. I oh. really like to. And I mean, I've still got my DS Lite, so I've got the region-free DS. It's just one of the things I haven't gotten around to yet. Oh, I gotta do it. See, the thing is, it's called Ultimate Butoden. It doesn't have what makes a Butoden game, though. It doesn't have that split screen, or maybe it... No, no, it doesn't have the split screen. But it's got the key charging and the different super moves. I I really do feel like they just wrote Butoden to get people like us, the nostalgia factor of, oh, remember the Butoden games. And that nostalgia tug goes as far as the unlock code from Super Butoden 2 and 3 works in this game. And a variation of it as well gets you uh, Bardock and Broly as unlockables. And you get the same cock. (laughs) Goroto. <laughs> nice. the code. So it's like, ah, oh, all right. These guys played those games. They know what's up. So, I mean, I talked about Ultimate Butoden a couple times on the show, written review. My goal is to have it up before the next Dragon Ball game comes out. Connect is out soon. I don't know if that's going to happen, but uh, not really a Butoden game other than in name only, but uh, probably the best Dragon Ball game you've never played. See, that's why I haven't gotten it yet. I'm waiting for the written review. <laughs> it's my fault. Waiting on you, buddy. <laughs> I killed it. So that's kind of this uh, travel through time of Super Butoden. There's a lot more we could say, but what I want to do is turn it over to all of you folks. Holy crap, the international love for the Super Butoden series. I kind of want to read a couple of these stories, if you don't mind, because they're awesome. 
Let's start with our buddy Timo here. I believe Timo's in Germany has sent me a German version of DBZ Movie 1, so I think I'm required by law to read his story here. <laughs> Timo says, I love them. They're pretty hard at the beginning because the gameplay differs so much from your average fighting game back in the day. I think this game doesn't... I gotta give him slack. He's not a native English speaker. I think this games don't want to be your competitive fighting game like Street Fighter. Every Butoden brought me so much DBZ experience and atmosphere. I own Shin Ultimate and since a couple of months Buu Yu Retsuden. Last week I got a Super NES and now I hunt for Butoden 1 through 3. Love it. Love that stuff. Good luck. They're great games. You gotta find them. Alright, Romain writes... Played the hell out of the Genesis one when I was a kid, even though the French translation was crappy. Played a lot of Butoden 1 and 2 at my friends' houses. Those were good games. And to this day, they are the first in my mind when I think about Dragon Ball games. See, there you go. The French folks getting Dragon... I'm so sorry that this is the one that comes to your mind when you're playing the game, though. Yeah, That's that sad. that hurts. <laughs> All right, Gary says, I've actually owned a Super Mutonen 3 car until some prick stole it. But I also owned a Pro Fighter X for the Super NES so I could easily play off those floppy disks. I've always had a hard time with Super Mutonen 1, though. You and everyone else, I think. Yeah, as I say, did anybody have an easy time with Super Mutonen 1? <laughs> no. So Trevax writes... The number of hours I spent on Butoden 2, 3, and Ultimate Battle 22 must be over 9,000. Thank you for that. So, we, we collectively groan at you, but at the same time, it's probably not that far from the truth. Uh, I think another one I'm required by law to read here from our buddy Sean Kaboom. I have sad memories of waiting for months to hear word of an English release for Ultimate Butoden, but then it never happened. Now it's hella expensive to import. I am sad. Well, we'll tell you what, we'll split a copy. Me and you will go have these. <laughs> I don't think it worked that way. Joint custody. <laughs> <laughs> of a DS game. I love it. Yes. Okay. Raul writes, I have very fond memories of Super Butoden 2. When I lived in Ecuador, we couldn't really afford the games because they were ridiculously expensive. On my birthday, my mom surprised me with a present. It was a bootleg 10 games in one cartridge, and Super Butoden 2 was one of them. It blew my mind because at the time, Dragon Ball was airing, but we didn't know what Dragon Ball Z was. We knew the Kamehameha, but we didn't know all those weird new characters. And what? You have to input a code to get to play as Goku? Amazing. So that's really cool. I mean, I love that. It's bootleg, but it's also Ecuador. It's just like, eh. Whatever. I mean, I bought my copy off some kid at school, and I learned recently that it was a bootleg, so I've really got to <laughs> get the actual copy, but it came with a box and everything. Really? I think the big giveaway, looking back on it now, is the price tag is in Mexican pesos. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> pesos yen same thing i was so desperate at the time i probably just didn't pay attention yeah no idea all right joey says when super buto dan one was released on the sf oh super famicom there was a feature on uh in egm i remember reading the article on it and seeing the two small pics posted with one of the pics a man in orange with spiky hair thinking back to watching a cartoon movie on tv called dragon ball i questioned if the spiky haired guy was zero's brother or father maybe a grown version of Zero himself. It compelled me to write to EGM for more info about this show. A few months later in EGM, there's an article on one of the DBZ arcade games that came out at the time. This time it was nearly a page long. And the article was a brief synopsis of a storyline in DBZ about a group of supercharged fighters fighting an alien organism made of living cells from dead fighters. They described the storyline we now know as the Cell Saga. For the longest time, I thought they responded to my request, not realizing I probably wasn't the one who had emailed them begging for anything DBZ. It did nothing but fuel my desire to see the show even more. Couple great things here. Number one, another fellow EGM reader from back in the day. Yes. Number two, Harmony Gold I viewer. I was going to say that. Now, that's, awesome. that's hardcore. Love it. This is someone who just randomly caught the Harmony Gold airing in 1989. That would have been um, maybe it re-aired a little bit after that, but that's awesome. Jason writes, I have all three Super Butoden games on the Super Famicom. It reminded me of a simpler time when DBZ fighting games were fun before the series ended and Namco Bandai released unnecessary sequels after unnecessary sequels every year. Up, X, down, B, L, Y, R, A. Amen there. I mean, I remember that code like it's nobody's business. But I kind of want, I love this comment because it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier where, yeah, we get game November after November after November. These Super Butoden games, though, three games in two years. Yeah. And Unnecessary Sequels, I think two was a great sequel. Three was great in many ways, but it had problems. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of like, hey, there's more characters in the story now. Time to put out a new game. All right, we got one more story for you. This is a longer one, but again, another one where uh, I'm required. This is less by law and more by mob contract, I think it is. Our buddy Tanuki 
sent in the email and uh, here we go. Back in 1996 or so, there was this mom and pop video game store that would sell imports. I never paid much attention to the imports since they were about 40 to 50 bucks used with no box. But one day I saw Dragon Ball Z 2 for Super Famicom. I kind of freaked out. I had no money for it. I was like 15 and it was $55 for the car only. I knew it was more than the usual imports, but I had to get it. Long story short, the guy allowed me to pay periodically. Whenever I would get 5 or $10, I handed that shit over so fast. I eventually got to take my baby home from the hospital. I mean, I finally got to take DBZ2 home. I played it and was kind of surprised how different it was than Street Fighter or any other fighting game I'd played. But hey, back then when you were a kid and get a new game, all you can do is play it, even if it sucked. Not that this did, it was just different. I spent a good two to three hours that first day playing it. It became one of my favorite Dragon Ball related games ever. It wasn't long until the internet came into my house. I searched other Dragon Ball games and found Super Pope's site. It's where I learned this game was Super Butoden 2 and not DBZ2 like I've been calling it. But hey, I trailed off enough. In conclusion, I love Super Butoden 2. I have fond memories of playing it even after the Nintendo 64 was released. It's one of those games that has a huge nostalgic value. It really captures a time and place from my childhood and fandom that I can revisit whenever I play it. So mad props all around there with the legally purchasing <laughs> the game for one, <laughs> paying on installment plans for two, uh, not knowing what it was called for three, finding Super Pope for four, number five, it being Super Bruton N2 that whole time. I love the Super Pope callback. Oh man, yeah. I love that site. So good. So good. I mean, that was that was our culture of the time was sites like Super Pope's uh, DBC video game reference site and Susinshu and all the media sites that were out there like Son Gohans and Raditz's and we were just finding all these different things not realizing how extensive this franchise was and to kind of pull it all back around that's my segue here I think that's why I love these Super Butoden games even for all their faults because it not only reminds me of a time when I was discovering just how expansive this franchise was but I think they do a good job of representing that themselves Selves. They are this parallel universe of Dragon Ball to me, and that's just the presentation and the story and especially the music that it almost that could be its own thing. Just the Dragon Ball video games to me. If there wasn't a manga, if there wasn't a TV series, I probably wouldn't like the games as much as I do, you know, to fall back on it. But I feel like them inclusive, just them, that could be enough to drive a fandom. Oh, yeah. There's been so many of them and they've grown and changed so much over the years that it it almost is its own franchise. And I mean, especially the Super Butoden games for me, I mean, it just, it reminds me, like you said, of a time when, you know, you're just discovering the series. And so for me, when I go back to those games, I still, I still get that feeling. And I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a dub snob where I don't like the dub at all. And I, you know, when I go back and play Super Butoden 2, it's like, it doesn't exist. It's like, this is back when everything was fresh and new yeah, and yeah. it was just nothing but excitement and yeah. scouring for information. That's what it is to me too. It's that wide eyed, optimistic, I'm not running my website yet kind of feeling where everything is, well, maybe I was running my website at that point. I started my site January 98. So by the time I played these games, yeah, by that time I would have had my computer. So it was around the time that I was discovering these, but then I got the soundtracks, but I don't know. It's all so weird because that was 14 years ago. Yeah. That's almost half my lifetime ago. <laughs> so these games have been with me basically half of my life. And I mean, obviously things like Mario and Zelda and all the standard franchises have been with me much longer, but these games in particular hold this weird place where they're kind of crossing the lines between this larger fandom and just being the games themselves. That's a special place. It is. It feels good. It does feel good. So Joe, thanks for jumping into the past with me before uh, we get ready. Uh, this is one of those basic questions, but kind of to put it in perspective who you are and what you got going on. What you been playing recently? Uh, what have I been playing recently? I've been jumping between a lot. Uh, Jet Set Radio HD because that was one of my favorite Dreamcast games. So okay, it looks gorgeous. Yeah. Um, and I can't afford Borderlands Two, so I've been playing Borderlands One. <laughs> That's fine. I I have it on PC. I have it on PS3. I've never played it. It's good. I mean, I'm I'm definitely having fun with it, even though I'm just kind of playing by myself while my friends is just populated with people <laughs> playing the sequel. I understand what that's like. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, just Super Putoden. Uh I do have one game I want to mention, totally unrelated to Dragon Ball, but 
uh, related to Dragon Ball at the same time. That's an indie game from, I believe it was last year, called To The Moon. It's not really a game so much as it is a visual novel, but uh, it's got some clever Dragon Ball references in it. And it was just $4 on good old games recently. I believe the standard price is $10. It is worth double that if you're into good stories. So that's my little plug for a cheap indie game that will have some Marvel and Dragon Ball references in it if you're uh, into that. Hey, my my boat is floating right now. (laughs) Good. (laughs) I'm glad that I can make boats of other men float. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what's going on. (laughs) I just wanted to throw that in there. I think we might need an adult to come down here and separate (laughs) us. Because clearly we've reverted back to our, you know, (laughs) to when we played Super (laughs) Matodan. Exactly. So, dude, you're going to come back and review Dragon Ball Z for Connect with me, right? Absolutely. Who else is going to do it? No one. No one. <laughs> I am going to jump on that grenade for the rest of the fandom. I appreciate that. Everyone appreciates that. The game's due out in like two weeks or something, right? Is it really? Man, that sneaks up on you. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so I'll talk to you then, right? Absolutely. All right, we're back like magic somehow or something. Uh, Heath, we've already done the topic. We did the news earlier, you and I. We did a little bit of feedback there within the topic itself. We've been going for a while. We missed last week, but we still have this giant show for you right now that I do kind of want to wrap up so I can go enjoy the rest of my evening. You have a child and a wife to get back to. But before we're done, why don't you tell me what's been up in the animation styles guide? Oh, all sorts of things. I think, let's see, since the last time we did a podcast, I've done uh, Tadayoshi Yamamoto Murrow. All right, so one of the um, biggies. Yeah, from Shindo Productions, uh, you know, big star pupil guy. He's pretty awesome. I like him. You're, uh, I okay. don't dislike him <laughs> in comparison to Nakatsuru. Come on. Uh, and then after that, uh, I said, you know what? We haven't done enough bad. I've done a lot of good. So we went with Yukio Ebisawa. I could have sworn Ebisawa was already done. I just had purged it from my mind, yet somehow knew it was That's already what you there. thought. That's what you thought. That's what I wanted you to think. But, you know, he's confused a lot with Uchiyama. So that's... This is every sour shot you have on the homepage. This is the... I think he's been coined the Lupin Vegeta from the uh, Namek episodes where he goes to the village and kills everyone on his own and steals the And then you get the one shot of him where he's turned and just his (laughs) neck. (laughs) He's like, like... His body is this... Backward letter C, almost. It's very strange. Someone's grabbed him and just stretched him out. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's a fantastic episode in all the wrong ways. So we have Ebisawa to blame there. So you can read more about Ebisawa over there. So I have those two that I have done. Um, I'm not sure who I'm doing next. My guess is I'm doing Akatsuru, but we'll see about that. All right. I may switch it up, but I'm thinking next I'm going to just start hitting out all the Toei animation animators. Cool, cool. So that'll be fun. And then um, let's see. I've been working on some random like guidebook pages a lot lately. So I'm doing that nice. and uh, trying to get some interviews sent over to Jake and Julian, maybe get those done. So, I mean, we got things going on. You're doing reviews and who knows what. I do and, have a uh, special project in the works. I haven't told anyone. Yeah. Well, These actually, I have cats? I have a couple special projects. Yeah, no, nothing involving cats right now. Uh, a couple special projects. One, the so-called in all caps special project. I think our part of it is totally complete as of this weekend. I hope so. What it was it? Was like the final, final, final version. <laughs> it was like final, final, final times two for reals. Uh, yeah, additional documentation provided. So I'm. Um, Really, really, really excited for this in ways that I never thought I would be. I'm I'm totally on board with you on that. When we first started doing this, I was like, ah, I don't know. And then the more and more we were delving into it, I'm like, this is going to be pretty awesome. Just to actually see it done, I it scares me. I hope it's really, really, really long, too. <laughs> From With all the information we've given from our end, I'm sure that it will be. <laughs> so I'm psyched for that, but I am also working special project website content. Uh, Heath, you and I were talking about this. I am impressed and in awe of your ability to produce website content with a child. I'm blaming work on my inability to get things done, but I'm like, work versus child? I think Heath wins. How is, I guess I really can't blame anything here. So no, I guess I'm just lazy. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I would, but not to your face. 
We do have Pokemon Black 2 coming in next week, and then I have a wedding that I'm going to and partaking in, and then we're like heading into holiday season. So if Mm -hmm. I don't get a web page done soon, and I got two games I'm going to be reviewing this fall, winter, damn, yo, it's busy times for Dragon Ball. My my philosophy with running a website has always been have multiple people, and the main reason is usually, especially now, there's like, what, four of us? So if one person is working on something, the other three can take a break, and then when that person becomes busy, usually somebody else now is free, and when we first started, I did a lot, you did a lot, then we kind of took breaks, Julian stepped in, and he's like, hey, I'm going to translate all this stuff, yeah, you know, in his manly Julian voice, <laughs> and then... Uh, you know, then I've been working on stuff, you've been working on stuff, and I think we've done a pretty good back and forth with a lot of things. And with you with a new job, me with a new kid, it's just been kind of comes and goes, and Julian's got his own thing going on, and Jake's off on Mars saving the planet, and yeah, you know, that this is what we do. This is what we do, and it's awesome. What happens when we all have kids, and in particular Jake, when he has children on Mars? I'm going to train my children to run my website for me yeah yeah I'm so i'm you. just gonna tell them what to do and this is the reason to have it. children to run our websites and to play video games with and to mow my lawn <laughs> that too <laughs> didn't you always think that when you were a kid and your dad was like go out and mow the lawn like when i have do kids it. one day i'm gonna make them mow the lawn and that'll show them i was asking my wife i'm like so how old does he have to be to push <laughs> yep, a lawnmower yep Oh, that'll be fun. I'm looking forward to that someday myself. All right, we're done. We're done. Heath, thank you, sir. Tell the kind kids where the website is. You can find us at www.fullstop.k-a-n-z-e-n-s-h-u-u full stop c-o-m. That's it. All right, guys, gals, gentlemen, gentlewomen. This is episode 311 of our podcast here at Kanzen Shu. We'll see you at some point in the very near future for episode 312. So for Heath over there, for Jake off on Mars, for Julian over in Japan, for Mary upstairs joining us occasionally, for all these wonderful folks, my name is Mike Mujito EX. We are from Kanzen Shu. We love you. We love everything about Dragon Ball, and we're having a great time. So we'll see you soon. Later, folks.